have those, you just check in over there uh, where you checked in uh, this morning to get your whatever you need to go in there afterwards. So you can do that. If you didn't bring the ticket with you, they have a list over there of everyone who did purchase the ticket for that. If you didn't purchase the ticket for it, you can still go over there and purchase it now and still be the general one. So still be a part of it. So, um, we have a couple of other upcoming events. Uh, just, uh, just to know about the, uh, our annual Planning Congress picnic will be uh, in June 13th, like we've the past couple of years uh, at Carla Park. That's June, Saturday, June 3rd. So look for announcements on that. And then our annual planning challenge event um, that's been a nice the past couple of years as well this coming year. That's uh, June 22nd to Thursday. It's a pretty much an all day event. With, uh, a lot of planners that have come in from around the state to uh, talk about uh, planning challenges, especially uh, with relation to uh, sea level rise this year. We also have a sign-in sheet that's circul cir circulating back here to the grant. You can credit and make sure you sign up for that. And then, uh, thanks to our speakers who volunteered to uh, speak to you, uh, we have Bill Cross, principal site planner with Palm Beach County, and he's going to speak to you a little bit uh, sort of about the county level and the, the, the uh, code changes in the, the LTC that have um, that they've recently adopted uh, with the, uh, relation to uh, breweries and, and like. And then we also have uh, Denise Pennell with the uh, Westgate CRA. He's going to explain how that's all being implemented in uh, Westgate. And we also have Matt Stinson, who's the owner of uh, owner operator of the complex brewing, which is in West Street here in uh, Palm County. So we'll, we'll be we'll be soon. We're working on it. So um, we will um, let them speak for a couple minutes each, and then we'll step out to uh, uh, go to the first. Let well, you go first. <laughs> I can just run across the bed screaming and I'll break the ice. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's an imaginary podium there. All right, so, um, yes, this is a uh, last minute. Scott Rodriguez, who yeah. is the uh, planner that I have signed to handle this particular topic, and volunteered to speak here today. And uh, as of yesterday afternoon, I think. About, about 1 o'clock yesterday. About 1 o'clock, I got asked to go in. I have the PowerPoint in the handout. And you can see, obviously, thank God. You can just hand out here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> But I want to talk a bit about the big picture of uh, where we're looking at our code and when something like this particular use comes along, why it's an issue for us and how we have to look at it in depth. And the first picture is, I think everybody back in the early 2000s, the big housing boom. Everybody remembers that there was a lot of land conversions from industrial to residential. And uh, Mike Bornstein and the County Planning Division and Greta Bonnaroo and all them put together a study for the leading cities, I think. Yeah, 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 high part. And they did this study that said we're losing all of our industrial to residential conversion in this hot real estate market. We need to do things to protect yeah. our industrial uses. So that philosophy oh, has carried through at the county level in that we are directed to a certain extent to minimize any intrusions into industrial uses so that we can protect those lands for when kids in Delaware or other folks are trying to attract job in or their industrial uses. County. That's not to say that we don't have other uses that are sometimes more expensive industrial districts and they say it's too expensive. Industrial land is not available. Industrial is too expensive. We need to be accommodated elsewhere because we don't have enough industrial. So it's a give and take type situation. We've got land conversions, we've got other uses intruding into industrial, and when the market gets hot, we don't have enough built industrial space, we get pressure from other industries to locate out in residential districts, agricultural districts. So we're always looking at the big picture. The next thing that we have is that when we do have industrial uses, we are directed to protect them, and we're directed to protect them in a way that uses that come in that sometimes fit, and they have accessory uses, how can we accommodate them without adversely impacting industrial districts? And that includes, sometimes, and we do, very rarely, I can't name a whole lot of these folks, some people say, I don't want this use in my industrial district because there's people there at 11 at night and I got all my equipment stored over here in the yard and I don't want a bunch of drunks 
run over here and jump on my equipment, stealing it, run away with it, whatever. So industrial business kind of had that perception that it's there 8 to 5, and then it shuts down the weekends, it's quiet, I don't have to worry about my stuff being bothered. The other aspect of it is that when we get into the details of land use conversion, this type of use in industrial districts, we have a problem with parking. If we don't have the philosophical thing that some of the smaller jurisdictions have where parking isn't now, not as much of an issue. We have direction to ensure that all uses are parked for the highest best means, and that means that probably over parking sometimes. And that's a, that's a complication for us that we're trying to balance. So the last big philosophical thing is that we do look at unincorporated Palm Beach County and what the expectations are of folks who are moving to that area. And it's still Euclidean zoning, it's separation. Don't let this use intrude into my residential neighborhood, my gated community, whatnot. And again, we've not been as successful as the smaller jurisdictions in organized areas in accommodating mixed use development. And I am very jealous of places like Elizabeth Station, where uses are transitioning from industrial to a whole bevy of breweries, retail, restaurants, entertainment destinations. So, you know, there's that give and take with county. It's much more suburban, Euclidean, and you don't have some of the advantages that the, the smaller jurisdictions have in the organized areas. Then we get into the code writing for the specific use inside the industrial district. I mentioned parking. We are still required to accommodate parking. We don't have all the flexible solutions that I think these uses need. These uses might say, hey, this is predominantly a weekday industrial park use. My peak hours are evenings and weekends. We can work something out. And it's a little bit of a difficulty to maneuver through the process to say we have flex space and parking right now. Then we get into, again, protecting industrial. We haven't allowed restaurants and bars and industrial districts to incorporate in Palm Beach County. We have asked, and the direction still to this day is that's not a use we want to encourage, even though it might serve the workers after work. It might be a good thing to be able to go to lunch. And Riviera Beach is a restaurant that I used to go to. It's great. But the direction is don't allow bars and restaurants. So, we now have this new industry that's not so new. It's been around for decades. Great uh, Irish Gardens, we have gardens. They brew their own beer. We've had other restaurants that brew their own beer. We have always allowed microbreweries or breweries to accessory to a restaurant. No code required. It's always been there. We've always had them. So now we have the industry is proliferating. It's a good thing. And we have younger people who don't need that atmosphere. They don't need a fancy restaurant. They don't need to be in commercial high traffic streets, but that's an issue you'll speak to. Um, so we go into an industrial space. Industrial space works good. I'm doing the beer, I'm doing the brewing. It's completely, totally an industrial use. But now I want to sell some of my uses. We follow the state laws. State. The big breweries, we call it the, the, the bottlers. The macro, the macro breweries, the big, big ones. Well, there's the micro breweries, then they've got says don't yeah. allow them to sell. Yeah, oh yeah, that's the macro board. That's the bottle board, the Miller, that's the macro board. Okay, so now we know that we have limits on micro breweries. They can only be so big. Now we can accommodate what we call the tasting rooms. And tasting rooms are fine. They're perfectly fine with state law. You can get your growler, you can go to your favorite micro brewery, you can buy beer, you can sit down and sample beer. And uh, as long as you can park, it's great. What we haven't gotten into that I think we need to take is the next step. Two things. One is know that the industry isn't really just, I make great cider, I make great pear, everything. Beer, beer socket, right. wine, anything. I make great beer, stop by on your way home, fill up your beer thing, have a few case, and go home. We know that it's more of an entertainment destination, and they're going to have more special events than our code for the holiday. We're going to have bands, music, food trucks, lunches, you name it. <coughs> and we've not really had the code grow with that. That's the next challenge. But the next challenge, and this is from Hockey to the Knees, is that when we do allow these users in commercial, we, unlike some of the smaller jurisdictions, don't have an entertainment district. We don't have commercial districts that we recognize as being a row of bars or a row of restaurants or 
both clubs and be subjected to hours of operation if they're within a certain distance of where the residential. And that brings us back to that Euclidean thing. The residents will call our fellow commissioner and say, this use is past 12, I can't sleep, shut it down. But we know that there are certain uses that are acceptable. And we need to have something that establishes a foothold to create an entertainment district where we can accommodate the hours that these uses might be wanting to have in commercial without really going out and calling them a bar or a lounge because they're really something different. So that's about some of the key things that we've looked at. You want to go next or second? Sure. So that's the first thing that you have to kind of figure out what is a brewery. A 
brewery is a really cool craft movement that's going on with creative people who are super focused on consuming something different, consuming something interesting, enjoying good times with friends. My name as a facility is The Accomplice, and that is the embodiment of what the craft movement is all about. Wine, beer, cider, sake, craft distilleries, if they are a craft facility, it is some dude who dream wants to make something awesome and interesting for people to come out and enjoy themselves. If it's destructive to you, it's destructive to us in our community. So think that way first. Because how many of you have gone to one of these places and that's why you want one? Okay, stay the hell off the industrial equipment, folks. Just say. You know, like, you're not going to do it. You're our crowd. You're our peeps. So that's what you have to realize. Now, with that in thinking, you also have to realize what do you want? What is your conception? What is your interest? We're working on a hybrid idea right now with Westgate that we're talking about possibly doing rooftop farming on top of the building. We're talking about it. It's a possibility. We would love to do it. How many of you guys would love to see a winery with rooftop farming in your, in your community? Pretty damn awesome, right? Like, seriously, that's us. That, here's those people. Hi. <laughs> you want us. That's the thing. So what you have to do is you have to create the business you want in your room. Very simple. Just think, we would love to have this freaking insane, crazy thing where they go up to the roof and harvest the berries two or three times a week while they're in season, come downstairs to crush them. And people come see that, it draws tourism, it draws foot traffic, it draws business to my facility, in my county, in my town. I want that. Code it. We are very accommodating people. If you make the code, they will come. It is that simple. We started out five years ago, and the problem that we hit, actually, I'm seven years. Five years of my partner on these. So, but seven years ago, I started on this park, you know, this dream that I had. And so the problems that I had was there was no understanding of what we wanted to do. And it was understandable. Woodwood wasn't really around yet. White Beach was a, was a baby. You know, you had to go to Asheville, and even that was still kind of, you know, just a few years into their culture. That was new. You had to go to San Diego, really. And so, I think we're finally over that hurdle of, you know, what is a brewery? What does a brewery do? What is a brewery going to do for us? Do we really want one? What is it? What is this thing? It's bubbles and suds and, and, and alcohol and no biker gangs and no college parties. You don't want that. But that's what you have to realize is that if you code the facility in the building you want, you will find that there will be, if not immediately, pretty shortly after, a facility that's willing to come in there and go, you know what? It's not really ideal for what we had in mind, but I'd like to be open. And that's the trick right there. You will get the facility you want if you just code it the way you want it to be. Put it in the, put it on paper, put it in, it in action, make it happen by putting the code down. So the next question is, well, we're not really sure what we want, you know? What is this? How do we get this done? <laughs> Granted, a lot of us are assholes. It's true. But we're nice assholes. Come talk to us. Let's go. Call us up on the phone. We'll talk. John Lynn and Ryan Shanks down in Funky Good in North in, in uh, Brooklyn Park, they are one of the biggest success stories of that. They worked with their CRA down there and opened up what is now one of the biggest mammoths in Florida. That is an amazing facility. I don't know if you've had a chance to get down there and see Funky Buddha. If you have not, do it. It's fantastic. Even if you don't drink beer, just go see it. Because it's just a great example of what a, a, a CRA combined with a manufacturing facility can do for a community. There's all kinds of new homes going in there. They wanted to put residential in. Bang, it's happening. They want to develop industrial. There's very few vacancies in that neighborhood in the industrial parts. Foot traffic and volume cures most problems. You create your attraction inside of the zone, you will get the results that you want. It's pretty simple. And what you have to realize is most of the problem makers do not want to spend six to eight dollars on a pint of beer. Consider that. Who wants to spend six to eight bucks on a pint of beer? They might roll in on a Harley, but Damn, that's a nice Harley they're riding. 
That's gonna be a custom Harley with like chromed out like crazy. And yeah, the guy'll be wearing bright leather, but I guarantee you it's Belgian import leather. And it'll look rough, and he'll have the best tattoo art, but he spent three thousand dollars on that tattoo art. Think about it. That's who's rolling in. Oh, I'm tough. I'll have a cider, please. <laughs> I mean, really, that's what we're talking about here. So, this is what we do. We create that product, we create that attraction, and we're looking for places to go. And I'll have you know this. I personally know of 20 different manufacturers looking to come into this county to put brewery facilities in, to put winery facilities in. There's three craft distilleries I know that are just waiting for somewhere nice to go. We'd like to have you. Places like Ball Brewing and Criss Cross Distillery, like Little Guys. What we want to do with Westgate CRA, we want to create a co incubation space for that. We want to place, create a place where people can come make small batches on top of us. We're going to have our own brewery. Every brewery has a pilot system. We want to make that accessible to the small guy to come in and make a batch. And that will in turn create that cultivation of those people so that you guys can come in and say, hey, I like this beer. You seem like a nice guy. We should talk. So we want to create that space, that incubator. It's actually a brewery incubator. The only other one I've ever heard of existing was in uh, Houston, Texas. And they closed it because they opened up a bigger brewery facility for themselves. So I don't want to do that. Uh, my idea is more. I personally want to open up, I spoke to a couple of you, small breweries in many of your areas. Or big ones. In the case of the Westgate CRA, we want to open a big one there. That's going to be amazing. Um, and we want to combine ideas with like maker space. I mean, there's so much cool stuff going on right now. In America, we have this, it's counterculture. We used to be very consumerist. Consumerist is now considered a dirty word. Don't buy from China. Don't buy from Mexico. Let's help our own economy. Let's be Americans and support America. Craft beer is riding that like a champ. Imports are down 40% in this country. I don't know if you knew that or not. Import beer is down 40%. No America. Now that's a beautiful thing. That movement is now influencing other industries. Craft cabinet makers. Uh, people who are making uh, 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 robots and things like that. I mean, there's all kinds of tech industry is soaring up. Software spaces and all these uh, uh, co-working uh, tech environmental spaces and things are going on. We want to kind of associate that to some extent with us as well. We want to see that being near us. We want to try to incubate these these maker spaces, incubate this idea of this is where you come to do this stuff. And so when you're writing codes, don't be afraid to put some of that in there. Dream it up, stick it in there. Hey, we want to create something out of this space, and this is what we want. So this code is going to say this, this, and this. You'll be surprised what people will do to make their dreams come true. Code it correctly, code it the way you, what you think you want, and go from there. And don't be afraid to talk to some breweries that are already in existence. Granted, because the truck is awesome. Matt Brewer up is a plus, it's hard to get all of them. He will talk to you, he's a nice guy. Mike Walker at New South, that dude is awesome. He'll sit there and talk to you. He's a little jinx, he's had some bad stuff happen from over time, but he deserves that. He was one of the first ones in the county. So, you know, all of these people, don't be afraid just to call them up on the phone and say, hey, I'm from the city of, or the program that I work with. Um, the other thing that I'd like to say is pretty imperative is it's nice to have a go-between, to have like a CRA. CRA has been infinitely indispensable to us for the Westgate project. They have someone there to kind of say, hey, you know what, let's get a brewery. Let's go out and find them. Let's tell them what we can do to help them do that. We need that help. Most of the guys that are in my place are dreamers. We're not necessarily, I mean, granted, I've had a few businesses I've opened, and that's one reason why we survived. We bootstrapped our facility on $50,000. It was not easy. We, we almost didn't make it about 7,000 times. And we're still almost not making it from time to time, and that's just like the business of folks. So, but the thing is, is that with someone there to kind of make it happen with you is going to be an indispensable tool. So definitely you want CRAs. You want to have, you can have a CRA program or someone there that is part of that program inside your, your program that helps, you know, kind of usher them in, kind of go, you know, go, no, no, we, we would like you to be here. Come on. This is good. Nice. It's very 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 nice. Um, that's the kind of stuff that you want to think about when you're doing good. It's all of those things. Now, I hope that much was helpful. Yeah? yeah.
we ask people to invite me in. Uh, what questions do you have? Like to go on random tangents if you like. It's very entertaining. So these plazas, it seems like a lot of times they end up in the industrial because they're considered manufacturing and there's this distribution element. How important is distribution to these guys? And is the scale is relatively small so that it shouldn't be such a big issue? That's, that's a fantastic question. How relevant is distribution to manufacturing? And the answer is not at all. And extremely. And the reason why it's like that is it depends on your individual business plan as a brewery. When we opened up, we opened up distribution only. Bad choice. We actually needed our case room to survive. Our distributor did unpleasant things to us. And so we, uh, we near, that was the first time we nearly went out of business. Actually, it was the second time and the third time as well, working with our distributor. So I mean, we've actually got a great distributor. He really does, does wonderful things for us. We've got more distributors since then. But when you're first starting, having a tasting room space becomes a way of life. So even if you're primarily a manufacturer, I think you would be smart to give them a place, even if it's tiny, even if it's 10% of square footage, give them a place where they can sell some product to go, because unless they're multi-millionaires and have a lot of money to sing in advertising, you go that first year going, eh, just keep throwing money at it, we'll live. If they can't do that, they need a taste of them. So it depends on the scope. The smaller of the space you're going to give them, the more they will need to dedicate the tasting room. So think about that on the sliding bar of importance. The smaller the facility, the more of it needs to be tasted. If you're going to do that, I would say probably a commercial spot is good, except they might not be able to afford it. Depends on each of your cities. If you have an expensive area, we talked about this already a little bit, small to give you. If you have a small area, and you might put them in commercial zones, it's very expensive. You're going to really need that tasting room space in an expensive rent district. Because uh, that's, that's where the real problem is. Uh, so, so you know, food question as well. So like the food question, well, another sliding scale. I think that's one of the difficulties in the code writing is that how are you anticipating, you know, is there food or is there food? Is there lots of distribution where you got semis coming in out? Or is it going to be one truck a week and we have nothing to really worry about? Fantastic question. But, and this is what you have to realize, the state has already sorted this question out for you. There are two kinds of licenses in the state of Florida. One with tasting rooms, which would also, so tasting rooms only, which are manufacturing primary, and ones that allow you to only consume on-premise. So you can have distributed product, or you can have on-premise consumption only. I can tell you this, if you are going to be an on-premise consumption only facility, a CMBP, that's that license called in Brewing World, or an AMW, with that designation, it's like saying an SRX for the other two for COPs. SRX is the designation for if you're a restaurant. So the state has created the pub designation on all of these manufacturing licenses. They're the cheaper. They're about 350 bucks instead of 1500 bucks. So they're way cheaper. And that means you have to have food on site. So I think what would be smart would be to tie what licenses you allow in what zones. 